Great to see people from across the country. Welcome everyone. And just while we're admitting the last few people, I'm, I'm going to get us rolling. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Michael Hodgett, and those of you who've been with us uh, uh, know that I'll be the moderator uh, for today's forum, like our two previous forums. Um, I'm a uh, management consultant who works with the arts firm as a strategist, as a facilitator, and I'm for my appearances. I'm a I'm a white male, six foot tall, with gray hair, and uh, wearing a pink shirt and uh, a dark jacket. And behind me, you would see a, a light green wall with a piano against it that doesn't get played very often. I'm with you from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. And I would like to acknowledge that I am in Mi'kmaq, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. A quick reminder, we are recording today's forum and that will include the public chat. And if you don't wish to be recorded, please turn off your video. And now let me hand it over to Catherine Carlton. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, one and all. My name is Catherine Carlton. I'm Executive Director of Orchestras Canada, Orchestre Canada. I join you today from Peterborough, Nogojiwa Nong, the place at the end of the rapids, located on the treaty and traditional territory of the Michisagig Anishinaabeg, land covered by the Williams Treaty. Now, if you're like me, this week you've been considering the history and impact of residential schools on the land we are on. At the end of today's session, I'll paste a link to an interactive map on which you can identify the residential schools closest to where you are now and where you were when you yourself were going to school. I'm a middle-aged white woman uh, with gray hair that I have uh, put into a woman bun today. I have blue glasses and I have books in the background, uh, filled book bookcases. Now, as you've heard me say before, if you've been part of these sessions, the team at Orchestras Canada has been keenly following the explosion of digital activity by orchestras during the pandemic. In part, it's because we love music, and in part, it's simply because we're people who care deeply about your work. Through a survey about orchestras' digital activities that we undertook last fall, we put a few numbers to the phenomenon, but it was quite clear there was a lot more to learn. My initial research question when I began to think about this was about monetization, but I quickly realized there was a lot more to consider. These thinkings uh, inspired a request to the Canada Council's Digital Strategy Fund to take a closer look at the impact of orchestras pandemic era digital activities. We were thrilled with a rapid and very positive response from the Canada Council. From the outset, we envisioned this as a collaboration with orchestra managers, with musicians, with the Canadian Federation of Musicians, and with partner associations. We are all grateful to steering committee and initiative partners, including Bob Fraser from the Organization of Canadian Symphony Musicians, from whom you'll be hearing later today, Bernard Leblanc of the Canadian Federation of Musicians, Giovanni Savoie of the Conseil Québécois de la Musique, Tanya Dirksen of Orchestras Canada's board and also the Philadelphia Orchestra, and Tim Crouch of Soundstreams Canada, who is also chair, has been uh, sort of outgoing chair of our digital committee at OC. Also to our project team at the arts firm, Erica Beatty, Michael Hodgett, Michael Morial, and Tim Crouch. I also want to acknowledge our excellent simultaneous interpretation team, Christiane Martel and Merrick Redburn, with whom we've had the privilege of working uh, since our Montreal conference in 2012. The research project has consisted of desk research, plus a series of in-depth interviews, which led to the identification of the three key themes we've been talking about over the last three weeks, including uh, audiences, the money, and pride of work. Uh, the last of, of the three forums. Resources and recordings from all three sessions will be available soon on our website. And Boran, I believe, is pasting something in uh, to, the, to the chat now. I'm delighted today uh, to introduce you very briefly to our guests. 
uh, our guest speakers. They include Andrew Bennett, Executive Director of the Kitchener-Waterloo Symphony, Robin Whiffen, Executive Director of Against, Against the Grain Theatre, Daniel Bartholomew Poyser, Artist in Residence and Community Ambassador with Symphony Nova Scotia, as well as Barrett, Principal Education Conductor and Community Ambassador at the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. As well, Daniel is an Orchestra's Canada Board Member and Chair of our Equity Committee. Uh, finally, Bob Fraser, Bass Trombonist at the Victoria Symphony Orchestra and President of the Organization of Canadian Symphony Musicians. Thank you very much uh, to all. I look forward to today's discussion. I'm now going to pass the mic to my colleague, Lauren, to explain a few things about the tech for today. Enjoy, listen carefully. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm Lauren Drew, the Director of Member Services and Learning with OC. Um, I'm also joining from the Treaty and Traditional Territory of the Michisagi Anishinaabeg in Nogajiwanong, Peterborough. Um, a few notes on the tech and the logistics. Um, please keep your video and audio muted throughout. We are recording. Um, there will be a Q&A portion near the end after some presentations. So be sure to type your questions in the chat and phrase them as a question if you'd like uh, to ask the speakers them. Uh, we're lucky to have simultaneous interpretation and English and French today. Um, there'll be some instructions in the chat to enable this, um, but very briefly look at the bottom of your screen in the bar that should have a globe icon that says interpretation and you can select between an English and a French channel there. Um, we're also offering the option to view slide decks in English or French. So if you navigate to the top of your screen um, and hover your cursor near the top, there will be a bar that says view options. So please click that and select either my screen that says English slides, Lauren Drew, um, for the English version, or my colleague Lauren Zaza's screen, um, which will say diapositive en français, um, for the English or the French versions. And the slide decks were also circulated to you in advance if you're having any issues there. Um, we'll have English closed captioning from rev.com. Uh, so to enable this, please go to the bottom of your screen for the closed captioning button that says CC. Um, and again, we are recording today and we'll be circulating the recordings from this session, past sessions and summary resources in the coming weeks. So with that, I will pass it over to Michael Morial of the Arts Firm to present on our research. Hey, hello everybody. Uh, welcome and thanks for being here. My name is Michael Morial. I'm from the Arts Firm here in Toronto, otherwise known as the traditional land of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishwabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. I'm a white male with glasses wearing a blue and white shirt today in front of a green background. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll be walking uh, the group through today um, a little bit about that through the desk research and interviews that we conducted as part of this project, um, and that I'll make lots of room for our special guest panelists later on. Just as a reminder, this is the final of three forums. Uh, we started with the audience. Uh, last week, we talked about the money. And today is all about pride of work. These are the three elements that we've identified as main considerations for success in digital content. Next slide, please. So I think that the first big, on the, first, on the previous slide, excuse me, um, there was a data point saying 84% of orchestras tried at least one digital initiative during the pandemic. Um, but the future has a lot of unknowns. So on the next slide here, um, we know that audiences have been consuming digital content during the pandemic, but they won't consume as much after the pandemic, um, is what we heard. Financially, we know that these initiatives won't fund themselves in the future. So in order for digital initiatives to be sustainable in the long term, we need to change the way we work. And that's what we mean when we say pride of work. Both management and musicians are immensely proud of the work that's been done during the pandemic. And today we're asking the question, how does pride of work happen and what needs to be true for it to continue? Next slide, please. So what do these new ways of working look like? In our orchestra, in our interviews, orchestras told us that they knew that finding new ways of performing and operating were essential to survival during the pandemic. Uh, the, the organizations who succeeded showed a great agility to changing conditions like public health measures that were changing, funding opportunities that were appearing, uh, or new online platforms that they could engage in. Um, so what did we see? We're going to zoom in on a couple areas here on the next slide. Uh, musician support was a big part of it. Um, we'll hear more on this uh, from, from Bob's perspective shortly here. 
And none of the successes would be possible without the musicians. We saw so much enthusiasm and creativity from the musicians, uh, and we know that this will be key going forward. Uh, under learning, we know that everyone on this call had to learn new skills and platforms and digital tools uh, during these past 18 months. And in many ways, it woke us up to a great professional development need in the sector. How do we ensure that the, the learning that we've been doing over the past 18 months continues even once the pandemic is uh, knock on wood over uh, soon? Uh, and finally, uh, leadership, having a music director and an executive director um, who could articulate a strong digital and artistic vision was crucial. Um, we have two examples of each of these uh, later in the session today. Next slide, please. We'll continue going through these, uh, sorry, on collab partners and collaboration. Collaboration with non-orchestral partners. This is already happening in many orchestras, but we saw so many great examples of this, uh, including Against the Grain, which we'll hear from Robin shortly. Under programming uh, for the digital world, uh, we know that programming is slightly different taking place uh, digitally versus on stage. And we heard a lot about this in our interviews. Organizations learned a lot about what content draws digital audiences, but that will continue to need to be explored as we move forward. And finally, artistic excellence is something that we all say we strive for. Um, and the question uh, remains of how we know when we've achieved this, uh, especially in the digital world. Next slide, please. Digital had a big impact on morale for musicians and management, and most musicians actively supported digital initiatives. Uh, but we did ask them to work in very different conditions. Uh, in the future, we'll continue to be asking ourselves these questions of what this will look like. Finding a business model that works for all the participants will be crucial going forward as well. Um, even though speaking directly with musicians wasn't necessarily part of the work that we carried out here, uh, we heard a lot of these perspectives, uh, and you can see some of them uh, on the next slide on a, on a panel on the right. Uh, again, Bob will be speaking about this shortly. Um, next slide, please. Let's quickly uh, look at a few major themes. Collaboration is a big one here. I'll let Robin speak more to that shortly because this is a great example from Against the Grain. Uh, high quality audio and video. Audiences have big expectations for us, and we heard that. Um, and this, I think, plays into artistic excellence, which we'll hear more about shortly, I'm sure. Uh, and finally, capacity. We've always had more ideas than resources in the arts, and executing these digital initiatives alongside live performances uh, will require um, a fair amount of discipline and planning going forward. But I think if we can make all these things true, then the learnings from the past 18 months uh, are only the tip of the iceberg for possibilities uh, in the future in the digital realm. And with that, I'll pass it back uh, to my other uh, colleague named Michael. <laughs> and thanks for keeping me up on the slides here. <laughs> Thanks very much, Michael. We're going to jump right in. So I'm I'm going to uh, we're now going to spend uh, each of our presenters have five minutes. I'm going to hand it over to Daniel. Daniel, you, I think you're muted. <laughs> so everyone a beer or drink of their choice. Uh, my name is Daniel Bartholomew Poiser. I'm in the land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas the credit and I'm a black man wearing a black t-shirt in front of a white background. When, when I originally heard that this was about pride of work, I thought that it was about LGBTQ2S plus inclusion in digital. So I had a totally different outfit planned for today, but then I realized it was this. So uh, we're going to go with this pride. Who are we making proud? Hopefully it's the orchestra will be proud of themselves and the community will be proud of the orchestra. So in speaking about this in true conductor fashion, I will be um, assuming there's no budget for anything that we're trying to do. And we're relying on what we have on hand for our imagination. And also assuming that there will be some budget to do some of the things that we want to do. I'm not gonna ask questions about what we can or can't do, but mostly focus on the artistic side of it. So assuming that we know that the audience is coming, we have people coming over for dinner and we have the money to buy the ingredients for dinner. What are we going to make? What will we make for them that we will be proud to serve? Um, once we have the audience, what then? Let us be artists is my plea. Uh, thought experiment. What if digital was all that was left? What if digital was all that we had? 
there were no more live performances, what would we do? No amount of funds will make up for a lack of imagination. No amount of funds will make up for a lack of imagination. So I have a couple of metrics that I've used for determining if, uh, if I'm proud of something. One, turn off the video. Listen, am I happy? Two, turn off the sound. Watch, am I happy? Then watch it twice in a row. Am I still happy? And then do I want to hit the share button? If I want to hit that share button, then I know, yeah, I am actually fairly proud of what I've done. So I think it comes down to three major elements. Um, story and emotion, thinking inside the box, and surplus value. What do I mean by these? In terms of story and emotion, we have to respect that digital is a totally new art form in itself. I think of the carry-on videos where all you could see was the conductor and the musicians kind of circled around or Leonard Bernstein reading off of a stand uh, in young people's concerts. We're telling stories with what we show the audience and a close-up of a conductor's face looking angry triggers you know mirror neurons in the audience they feel the anger or they see a musician waiting we have to be thinking about what we are showing and how we're telling a story through the shots that we're doing um watch so many conducting videos where you just see you know the beginning of Mahler five a close-up of the fingers of the trumpet player that's not really the story that we're after we need to think of digital as a concerto for camera and orchestra how are we telling stories with what people see how are we sharing emotion through the screen? Story and emotion. Secondly, thinking inside of the box. Let us be innovators and think inside of the box. If we're at the first year of 20 years of change, what happened in music history between 1810 and 1830? Egmont to Symphony Fantastique. How did Brahms advance motivic development? How is Viet Cong forcing us to reconsider today timber and theatricality and performance? How did Debussy rethink harmony? As a starting point, let us think inside the box. And what is this box? It's the box of creativity that we as artists work with every day. The composers who um, were never content and who are never content to replicate, but always pursued with ferocity, individuality, ingenuity, and yes, innovation in their drives to tell stories and express emotion through the artistic medium. Let us as artists now do no less with the imagination we apply to our digital offerings. We're competing with Netflix on their own turf. So let us compete and let us be artists. Artistry not only of content that we provide, but also the context. Um, finally, surplus value. Um, when you go to a concert, it's never just a concert. A concert is also a meet and greet, a fashion show, a coffee, a club, a class surprise. There are things that you get from a concert that are more than a concert. What are the things that digital does better than live concerts? How is digital to be really based? How is digital better than a live concert? There are factors that are better, so to speak. How are we capitalizing on them? How are we taking advantage of them? How are we maximizing those as much as possible? I can think of one very quickly, um, representing the community to itself. You go to a sporting event, you see yourself on the KISS cam, and you see yourself there represented. We can do this with digital, showing the community itself, reflecting the community back to itself. That's one area of surplus value that we can add through our digital presentations. So story and emotion, thinking inside the box of creativity that's been set before us through composers past and present, and surplus value. We're now in a time where a bassoonist, oh, there goes my alarm. We're now at a time where a bassoonist with a TikTok account can run circles around an orchestra with a multi-million dollar digital account. We need to communicate story. We need to communicate emotion. So let's add all sorts of value and be as innovative as the composers we love because no amount of money will make up for lack of imagination. Those are my thoughts on pride of work in digital. Thank you, Daniel. That's a great kickoff to our discussion today. And uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Robin Wiffen, who is Executive Director at Against the Grange Theatre. Robin, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everyone. My name is Robin Wiffen. As Michael mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of Against the Grange Theatre, which is an opera company based in Toronto. Uh, I'm actually coming to you from Toronto today with, on Treaty 13 territory, which is the ancestral traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of Credit. And I'm a white passing woman with long dark hair and I'm wearing a white floral top today in front of a um, New York Times article of the piece I'm about to share a little bit of uh, about with you all today. 
Uh, we'll, we can go ahead and get started. So one of the things that I wanted to chat about today was what does pride of work mean for us at Against the Grain Theater? And utilizing a case study of our most recent digital production called Messiah Complex, which was a partnership with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra and Against the Grain Theater, where we brought a new version of Handel's Messiah to life through digital means. Um, and that showed in this past December. And so we're gonna get into that a little bit. So next slide, please. So the Messiah Complex was a, a complex project in that it contained 12 soloists, four choirs and a 25 piece orchestra. So we had 25 musicians from the Toronto Symphony Orchestra join us on this piece. And about 200 people overall participated in this project. So it was very large for us as a very small organization. Uh, and I just thought I would share some of the photos, screen grabs from the video itself. Um, so this one is um, Spencer Britton, a tenor from BC, and he is singing in BC. Next slide, please. The piece itself, we reimagined what does it mean to do Handel's Messiah today utilizing digital, and that really expanded our idea of what we could accomplish with this piece. So through that, we had seven translations of the English, English text into other uh, languages. We filmed in 16 locations and we had 10 film teams across the country. And here you see a clip of Miriam Khalil Soprano um, singing in the Raphael Ruins in Ottawa. Uh, next slide, please. So this piece was a big experiment for us as a company. We'd never done a real digital um, project before. And so we really had very little expectations in terms of what the outcome might be. But I thought I'd share a few stats with you that we did have over 138,000 views on YouTube of this project. We had viewers from 44 countries and we ended up extending our run three times just due to the volume of uh, requests for us to keep the piece online, which was really interesting. Uh, and here you see a picture of baritone Elliot Medor um, at an arena, the Lions Arena in East York. Uh, next slide, please. So what did we learn? And I, I know that this is the question we're all grappling with. What have we learned through the last 18 months as organizations trying to figure out, does digital have a life um, beyond the pandemic? And if we go to the next slide, uh, you will see that our big learning was that collaboration and artist-centered work increases pride of work. So the piece, this piece for us was very different in, and it was a very different way of working because we had an, a large number of artists that we were working with all over the country. And that meant that we had a lot of opportunity to bring the stories to life of artists who traditionally would not have been here in the city with us working in a, in a more traditional production style. And so that provided us with an opportunity to share, share these stories in a way that put the artists at the center of the stories that they were telling. And that's the uh, definition I'm using of collaboration today. So often in, in a variety of disciplines from early childhood education to leadership, we hear this idea of buy-in. And what is it that it means for people to buy into a project or a process. And one, one of the things that we hear is that when people have bought into this process, they typically feel more pride when the outcomes are successful. And so in my opinion, the arts are really no different, um, which is why having artists at the center of our um, programming can be so rewarding. And I know that this is kind of it's a different way of working because we are used to working in these organizations where there is a hierarchical structure in that there's, you know, your artistic director or your music director and they determine your programming and then you may have guest artists who determine the um, artistic vision for a whole project. But what I would say is that we've seen through this piece in particular that this way of working can actually provide limits to how the artists in the room are contributing to the piece of work and ha can have a direct correlation to whether or not they feel pride of work in working on a piece with your organization. So the thing that I would like to explore then is how can we bring more artists to the table and provide them the opportunity for their voices to be heard when we're working on projects. And I think this is really exciting to consider when we think about 
collaborative partnerships with other organizations as well, because we're now expanding our capacity to tell really interesting stories and engage artists in a really meaningful way by stepping outside of what has traditionally been done uh, in terms of our how we program and um, create productions. So what I would like to finish with is that I think allowing more artists to be involved in the creation of artistic programming just increases our, the accessibility of classical music as a whole because it is allowing for increased representation in our storytelling and the artistic vision that we are um, putting out there through our programming. And one fun example of this is um, when we were seeing the numbers of people who were coming to watch Messiah Complex, there were really large contingents from the different provinces and territories, and they would put a note on their ticket saying, I'm so excited to watch Julie Lumsden here, who you see, because she's from my province. And so I think that bringing these artists into the decision making and bringing them in to tell their stories in a really meaningful way just increases pride of work across the board. It increases our ability to be accessible as organizations. And I think can also just really expand the future of classical music, both through in-person, but also digital, which I do think is here to stay. So thank you. Robin, thanks very much. Uh, now, Andrew Bennett, Executive Director, Kitchener Waterloo Symphony Orchestra. Over to you, Andrew. Well, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Um, greetings from Kitchener. I'm here on the Haldeman Tract, uh, the ancestral home of the Atawanda and the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. And um, just to follow up on what Catherine said, if I'm going to say one thing about Indigenous issues today, it will be that I will have my support to the investigation, which is unfortunately going to be very much necessary at the Mohawk School, on, also on the Haldeman Tract here in this part of Ontario. Um, I'm a white guy. I uh, have brown hair that needs a haircut desperately, like many people all over Canada. Um, I wear glasses and behind me you can see my study, which is my best attempt to make it look as though I might be cerebral. Um, you'll discover otherwise in my presentation, which I'd like to start now, please. Um, the KWS, um, I'm going to talk about it from the perspective of what is a largely regional orchestra. Yes, we have more aspirations, but our main commitment is to our region. Next slide, please. Here are some facts which I'm not going to go through, um, but just these are the starting points for us as an organization. These are the facts about the organization that you might want to know um, in terms of what side of scale we are. Uh, next slide, please. What was in our favor? Two huge things. One is that unlike many of the larger um, orchestras in Canada, our music director, Andre Ferrer, is based in Canada. That was serendipity. We didn't plan it that way, of course, per se. It was very helpful, though, in what we we're going to do. Other orchestras didn't have that advantage. And center in the square, well, what can I say? Um, I, I have been fond of saying that if we wanted to, we could have, it's so large, you could have the percussion section in Brampton and still you could hear them. It's such an enormous stage. Um, it allowed therefore us, unlike virtually every other orchestra in this country, to have the full orchestra performing in a physically distanced format. I think what we discovered, however, is that although we could fit the full 52 orchestra on, we couldn't quite hear each other across the stage, um, even when it was that large. And so in actual reality, we were normally working more typically with a 45 piece orchestra, because that seemed to be the, 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 uh, the the limit as to be able to hear. Next slide, please. These are the things we did. Uh, again, more than many orchestras were able to do. And so you'll see some of it was monetized and some of it was free. And again, we can talk about the detail, but I just wanted to just give you an idea about what we were doing. Because actually what I'd really like to talk about is in the next slide, which is how we approached it and what were the issues. We had an opportunity which was in many ways, the poster child for how to monetize streams in, uh, in this country. It worked incredibly well, so well that our income was 10% of what we would normally expect in a year. Yes, it was that successful. Um, you can take that either way. Um, we also were able to use our CRM um, software to continue good connections with our patrons. And we were able to work in three tranches. To some extent, we programmed in an experimental way. Sadly, some of what we tried 
wasn't able to happen because of the restrictions coming in. And so, for example, events in April, which we planned, which were a little more out there, didn't eventually come to progress, but that, that's life. Um, the challenges were that we had relatively little brand recognition outside our home, home region, huge in the region, but difficult elsewhere, that the wonderful technology in our venue turned out not to be nearly as wonderful as we wanted it to be when we came to try to actually use it for streaming. And that we found out that, well, surprised, playing in a distanced orchestra is really hard. I, I've I, praised the orchestra for not showing that, but I'm aware of quite how difficult it was as a technical exercise for the musicians, and that should never get forgotten. The only good news is that I think some of my players said, do you know, I think it might make us a better orchestra when we get back. So I think we might cling on to that. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned some of those challenges. I think that the other thing is that we had no in-house streaming experience. So we were learning as we were, we were working and, you know, working like you can see with those plexiglass boxes, it was really tough. We had a great workaround, but it was very tough work. Next slide, please. There were some notable successes. First of all, we kept everybody employed. I mean, that is the number one achievement which we, we will all cling on to and was important to us as an organization. We also found that we were able to reach communities with otherwise who had challenges in attending live performances, closed communities, long-term care homes and the rest. Fantastic success in that. And I think the largest thing is that the pride was something that was shared. It was pride within the organization, but all of my colleagues who work, for example, in fundraising, they said that pride was the word that came up over and over again that hadn't really, you know, artistic success was mentioned, you know, important community champion, but suddenly the word pride was on everybody's lips when they were talking about why they were continuing to donate to us. And I think that's very important. There were some noble failures. Um, I think one of them was discovering that with a visiting artist, if their, um, if their PR machine didn't align with ours, then the chance of getting a large extension of our audience was zero. We also discovered that when their, their PR machine was aligned with us, the chances of getting a larger uptake of people was zero as well. In other words, sadly, that didn't work by, by connecting with guest artists in that way. I think we could do better, but that was the reality we had to face. We also worked unusually for us, we also did almost all of our videos in francophone format as well, of which I'm very proud. We had almost no audiences for that, despite some excellent attempts at marketing across the province of Ontario. So you live and you learn. Next slide, please. I think we've learned. Our orchestra is, is, is com it comprises 52 incredibly self-critical people. That's great in many ways. It's marvelous that they're so, they have such aspirations. We also learned that they didn't know that they were that good. We learned that because they eventually, through the digital means, they got to hear themselves. And they found out that actually, amazingly, it was really quite impressive, the work they did. And that is a really important positive reference, I think, for musicians in an orchestra who don't normally get to hear their work through digital capture. I think we also learned, and this is gonna sound incredibly naive, but I'm gonna say it anyway. We learned that our orchestra is not a juxtaposition of a group of talented people. It's a real community, not just by accidentally playing, playing well next to somebody, but in that sense of playing together. And I think that what, if we've missed anything of orchestras all across the country, it's that real sense of regular community as musicians. And I think that this pandemic has accentuated that importance. And the questions which I've raised will come up in the conversation and we'll move on to that very shortly, but I'd just like to ask um, two before we move on. One is, does our core audience actually want digital for material if we can offer them live? I think the jury's out on that. And I think that Daniel's points are incredibly well made, but I think that's probably for a different audience and we can discuss that. And we, I think we all would love for a digital product to be a gateway to live audience events. People see it on digital and then turn up. At the moment, I don't think we have any evidence that that will necessarily work. 
again, I hope I'm, I, I hope it's proven right. It would be marvelous if it's true, but I don't think we yet know. Thank you very much. Over to you, Michael. Well, thanks to all three of you. Uh, that, that was a really great setup to the conversation that, that I want us to have now. And uh, I, I'd also like to, uh, so now we're, now we're gonna start, uh, start a bit of a, a group discussion. And I also want to welcome Bob Fraser. And uh, Bob is uh, probably known to many of you, but Bob uh, comes to our forum with with a he can you you may see him switching hats very quickly. Uh, he's a bass trombonist at Victoria Symphony. He's president of Oxum, and he's an Orchestra Canada board member, and he's on our steering committee. So Bob has uh, has got some some great perspectives to bring to this discussion. And I think, uh, I think the first question I'd like to pose to the panel is the, the one that Andrew, I'm sorry, the one that, uh, that Daniel raised about uh, what does digital do better than a live concert? Can, I'd just like to, to throw that out. <laughs> do you want me to start? <laughs> Your first, your first, Bob. I sh should get a chance to properly, uh, properly introduce myself too. Um, yeah, please. I'm yet another white male with glasses and a receding hairline. There are far too many of us in this profession. Uh, last seen wearing a black hoodie, um, and I'm seated in front of a piano. Which, if you can guess what piece that is, you've got better definition than than I do. The I, I'm on the traditional lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations uh, uh, territory of islands and inlets. And in fact, the street that I'm on is named in their language, Kamosin. It's the place where waters meet and are transformed. Um, I was able to, the nice thing about being in my position today is that I was able to solicit a lot of response from my colleagues across the country. And I did get very good uptake from uh, the 21 delegates whom I represent to each of our orchestras in Oxum, that, which is a group of 21. And, and that's only about half of what, I think less than half of what Orchestras Canada's full membership is, but it represents the 1200 um 1200 musicians uh, in 21 different groups and each group is represented by a delegate i had very good uptake from the delegates and i think the thing that they said that they appreciated about what digital did better was were two things one it reached out to people outside the geographical area of the orchestra that are that are difficult to reach and this is especially true of orchestras um, that serve a lot of isolated area, areas, like the Winnipeg Symphony um, also serves northern Manitoba and, and the like. The second was that it, was, um, it did excellent outreach to audiences that can't get into the hall for whatever reason, either COVID related or just the fact that they are people with uh, mobility issues. And uh, a number of my colleagues felt that that was one of the great rewards of uh, doing music in small projects from home when we when we still couldn't get into our halls and reaching out to people in isolated nursing homes and care facilities and actually not just playing music for them but getting to interact with them as best as you can through this medium so though those are the things i think that that digital does really well is is the expansion of, of our traditional audience. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that point out there. Shall, shall I go next, right. Michael? Um, I was I think muted. That, Andrew, go, go right ahead. I think there are two areas which are conspicuous, conspicuously successful. Um, one is connecting with audiences who find it difficult to get to concert halls. Mm -hmm. this, this is over and over again, we've had long-term care facilities and actually schools saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for video content. Um, so for example, at KWS in the last year, 
um, no digital is not the same as a live concert experience, but yes, we had twice as many school children involved with our schools program uh, than we, we would in a normal year. That's not a small difference. Um, secondly, um, we've had people in long-term care facilities absolutely lapping up the, the, the work we were to send out. So that's, I think, really important for reaching part communities, either geographical or because of their place in society that find it harder to connect. The other thing is that, and I, I'm not going to knock this, it may be small beer, but the fact that our orchestral players were able to show their families across the world in many cases, I mean, I'll just use my example, I mean, personal example for me, we did a great concert, we saw the, the image of working with Iskwe. My sister watched it in Sydney, Australia. That meant a huge amount to me personally, and you multiply that by everybody in our organisation who had that experience. That's a big deal, and it makes people feel more pride in their work for their connection to friends and family across the world. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a terrific point. That's a terrific point. Robin, what about, what about for you at Against the Grain? What, what does digital do better than, than what you, you would normally be doing live on stage? Uh, I think it gives audiences a different opportunity to engage with the art. And, and I say that because one of the things that we're doing very differently with our film work is that we have close-ups of our artists now. And we have these, it's a, the way of performing can be more nuanced because the camera is up close and personal. And I think that that provides a different emotional experience for audiences because, you know, I don't think that any of us can say that you can replace kind of the visceral feeling of having the music wash over you in a live setting. But, you know, like Daniel mentioned, we are competing with Netflix. And when our audiences aren't in the theater during normal times, they are at home watching things on their television. And I think this idea that we can provide them with artistic opportunities in, um, you know, a genre of music that they love, but also give them some of those pieces of TV and film that they also love. It's just a really interesting marriage that brings, uh, our, it elevates our art in a new way. And I think that that's really meaningful. And, um, and I think there's been a lot of, for us in particular, there's been a lot of really good feedback about providing that kind of an experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Daniel, uh, let, let's hear from you on this. It's your question. You're muted, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, I have two. I have two mute things happening here. Um, when we did the Thorgy Thor concert before Thorgy, so, so Thorgy Thor is the drag queen star from RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, before Thorgy comes out on stage for the first time, we show Thorgy on the screen first, so that they recognize and interact with that way that they've seen Thorgy before. So that when the actual real person comes on, then you get the deafening scream that we have to have, you know, ears plugs and ears for it, literally, right? So one of the things that it does uh, digital is it makes stars and then brings them close. So there's something different between seeing Jonathan Crow, you know, on stage, okay, fine. But then, ah, now you see Jonathan Crow like on a poster on it here and then on screen and up close the emotion. And then you see him at, it creates a start and then it brings close. Then you can talk and have an interview and see the reactions and see how the person laughs or whatever. So that notion of bringing um, something that is not foreign, but that is conceptually extraordinary, close home in your lap on your laptop, that's where we beat Netflix. Because the stars of Stranger Things, I'm not going to see them in Toronto anytime soon, right? Or even the stars of Schitt's Creek. But where we beat Netflix is that we say, here are our stars. They're on stage. They're on screen. And now, oh, we're coming to you. We're in a small group. We're doing a quartet. So I think that's our actually advantage. One of the things that we have, like our double threat with digital is having right. the digital and the live. As that's well, so on, yeah, digital allows us access. I don't like watching, con if I... I would watch concerts later at night all the time. So it allows a freedom of, of um, access to the orchestra anytime you want. And exactly what Andrew said, sharing it with your friends and uh, being able to rewind certain moments. Like there are moments of concerts that I've rewound five or 10 times because I just love it so much. Or you see an expression on somebody's face. So you can interact yeah. with the music in a very, very different way. Really different way of watching. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to point out um, there is a, there is a counter to this, and it's not, I don't want to be uh, uh, too much of a Debbie Downer here, but the, 
the thing about the way social media and the internet in general uh, has evolved is that artists uh, artists are very much expected to be public figures nowadays. There, there's a certain expectation, even if it's just sort of a persona that they're putting out there in front of the public. And when you talk about, whereas in the past we would talk about fans of a particular musician or fans or uh, music lovers or whatever, we use the word followers now in the, the, the current parlance. I hope that the translation person who's listening to me has found the correct French word for followers. And I want to learn what it is, actually. But um, uh, not all of us are going to want to be that. I, I'm, I hate to say it, but um, uh, some of us are naturally introverted and don't necessarily want to see that out there. So just putting that out as a caveat that there's going to be a certain number of us that will be able to step up and do this and we'll be happy to do that but there will be a certain amount of us who who might not and uh again i don't want to be i don't want to sound overly negative but that this is another thing that puts stress on people in my profession and keep in mind that um and we have data of surveys of thousands thousands of musicians and it's been determined that we are three times more likely, three times more likely than the general population to suffer from anxiety and depression. And mm. uh, these kinds of things where we're living our lives out in the public spheres like that can, can have a downside. That having been said, uh, there are always uh, there are always people who can and will be willing uh, to do this. And uh, the nice thing about a symphony orchestra is that it's a very large group of people. Uh, so you have a diversity within that group uh, of mm -hmm. people that will come to the table. I, I always say this to orchestra people in these, in these uh, conferences is that some musicians just want to show up, play and go home and we all we have to accept that that's sometimes going to happen um, mm -hmm. um let me let me throw out a question and maybe start with you andrew and that is so what can orchestras do to support musicians if uh, if some of these demands are different and more challenging what can orchestras do to to help i think first you just have to pay attention i mean that sounds incredibly obvious but being aware of some of the issues that bob has just mentioned have got to be front and center and you can't expect everybody to do everything, um, no, no matter what their skills are. And I think Bob is absolutely right. Um, I would go further. I say that there are some people in some orchestra, in most orchestras who really thrive on that kind of attention and opportunity, they love it. It's fantastic. And it's such a joy to work with those people as well as in that capacity, because it gives them another outlet for them creatively and professionally. So I think that it really is two sides of a coin. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's about play, playing to people's strengths. I'll give you one example from my experience in the last year. Um, uh, anybody who's on from Kitchen Waterloo Symphony will know exactly who I'm referring to, but one of the members of the orchestra a relatively um not public pu publicly facing member of the orchestra was asked to describe his record collection and did a video about his record collection and what was important to him about it it was one of the most heartwarming deeply musical deeply personal but if you like if you like not personal in the way that bob was referring to saying you have to put your personality out there so i think if you're creative you can work with players in an orchestra to play to their to their comfort zone and their strengths. Mm -hmm. Because I think, frankly, we've underestimated how interesting some of our players are until now. And we've been forced in the last 15 months to discover. And I have to say, even members of the orchestra have learned things about each other that they didn't know before. And that's been kind of neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah. You're muted again. 
I haven't used Zoom before, okay. so it's, uh, sorry. Um, so many, most, I'd, I'd say most of the great ideas that came out of the pandemic, uh, in, innovative things that we did at the TSO came from the musicians directly. So I agree with Andrew that it's about releasing people to do the things that they're comfortable with and not everybody needs to be a, a, a quote unquote star. Uh, and that wasn't my, absolutely not because you, you have stars of, um, you know, people who'd like to be on screen, but what about the stars in the orchestra that are writers or that would like to write or they do, you know, a script with tons of different ways that we can, that we can engage the orchestra. And in terms of prepare, like one of the problems is that we haven't really prepared the orchestra and there are musicians that want to come in and sit down and play and leave. But sometimes we don't incorporate, um, we don't think about the musicians and their understanding of what's going on. So a lot of times in these digital projects, one of the issues that I found is that the musicians could only be really proud of their work after the fact, after they see the completed project. And it is kind of a thing of come in, sit down, play, thank you, we're packing up the chairs, please leave. And in three weeks, you'll see what the overall idea was. I can think of only two times really in my career where we really sat with the musicians. One was a TSO um, Relax concert and the other was the Symphony of Scotia uh, concert with Alan Sailor the indigenous uh, musician, where we actually imagine this, talk to the musicians about what the project really was going to be so that they could have an understanding while they were in the process of what the final product was going to be. And I think that's something that we, um, where we just don't, right, we don't treat the musicians as well as we could in terms right. of helping them understand what's the right. big that, thing. That's a great point. And, and Robin, what about you? I mean, I'm thinking about uh, the way you recorded Messiah Complex, people were thousands of kilometers apart. You never had them even close to being in the same room. So how, how did you engage them uh, sort of in terms of making it meaningful for them? What, what kind of processes did you use? Well, I think that that's, it's a really interesting thing what Daniel just said about how do we engage the musicians? Because I think we forget that the musicians and the singers that we're hiring our artists, they have something to say artistically. So mm -hmm. we have to, we have maybe not every program is the opportunity to give them a platform to, to share you know, their perspective. But there is an opportunity to do that. And that's really what the Messiah Complex process looked like in that we had a conversation internally and said, we would like to do the Messiah in, with representation from every province. What does that look like? And how do we achieve that? And so then we realized well, with the restrictions, there was no way that we were having a single director go to multiple provinces because it, was, it would have been cost prohibitive and it would have been exhausting. So we had two co-directors who really were facilitators in a really beautiful way for the artists in each province to tell a story that spoke to who they are as a person and what it is about their province or territory that was meaningful to them. And then, so we had the artist, we had two co-directors, and then we had a director of photography who was, you know, the, the cinematographer, if you will. And those four people collaborated and they, vision cast and they storyboarded together. And so then at the end, the final product was not the product of one individual artistic mm -hmm. um, vision. It was really a beautiful encompassing of what each artist was bringing to the table. And so while exhausting, that happened in 16 different instances. And that's why each excerpt in that project is so vastly different because it does speak mm -hmm. to the creators that were in the room working on that aria or duet in particular. Mm -hmm. I'm, I did it too, I'm muted. Uh, there we go. Um, let, let me ask a question uh, really, again, maybe directed, directed starting with Bob. And, and that is, um, you know, what are the two or three things that, that coming out of pandemic conditions related to digital that musicians want to keep in the way they're they're performing sure that's a that's a great question um, i can tell you one thing that they definitely don't want to keep and that's covid oh, protocols oh yeah i think when when i asked when i asked my colleagues what the downside of of the of uh, digital was most of what they said was COVID related. They, 
uh, you know, the plexiglass boxes, the masks, the distance uh, between people, and just the general anxiety of going to work and not knowing whether you are going to get sick or make someone else sick, which yeah. was my big, like my, my biggest fear was making somebody else sick because I play the trombone, right? I always say that my instrument was upgraded from annoying to dangerous um, <laughs> during the pandemic. <laughs> the the things that my colleagues i think would like to see going forward they would like to see uh these things continue they very much want to see either blended offerings or or completely digital projects going forward um they're waiting on tender hooks to see what that will look like because they know it's going to be a financial commitment and a staff time commitment that is going to be a huge challenge and they all recognize that um they uh are really looking to be flexible and and in reaching out to the public so that's that's definitely good news um and i think that they uh they too like what Ra like a lot of what robin is saying would like some sort of avenue to be participants and contributors in more than just playing our our instruments um that's always a difficult road to go down because uh musicians are trained to do what we do and although some of us might have developed particular gifts it's not something that's built into our job description and again it's not built into the job description of a lot of staff people to do this kind of thing too so we're hoping that as we move into the uh, post pandemic world that we can all have a place where we can we can learn and experiment on these things together. I think a lot of us would like to see the technology become less obtrusive. That was something I got from a lot of my colleagues. Now, what are you thinking there? What would what would be well, not so much like because we didn't have audiences, we were able to have you know, people running around with cameras and and right. sort of like really in your face. I actually had camera person blocking my view of a conductor one day, which was great. Uh, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding, Daniel. Um, <laughs> yeah, and when he wasn't blocking the conductor, I said, "Can you move over a little bit?" So the the one of the venues where we perform here in Victoria. Uh, recently, unfortunately, it was a little too late for us, but they undertook an installation of seven permanently installed pan, tilt, and zoom cameras that are remotely controlled and audio uh, recording infrastructure that can be moved out of the way or suspended. And it's a perfect situation for blended performance where you have a live audience and you have a live performance of a, of a group. And you're able to capture it from a number of really, really diff different and very interesting angles. So that kind of technology, I mean, if there's if there's an argument for funders for infrastructure funding, that's that's got to be one of the things that we sh we should look into doing, because I th really think it's the way to go. And then you don't have people yelling on headsets to each other or whispering on headsets to each other in the middle of a quiet moment in a in a piece the other thing that that my colleagues mentioned is we need a central um we need some kind of a centralized either showcasing or distribution system for all of the wonderful things that all of the orchestras are doing mm -hmm. so that you know if the saskatoon symphony does a particularly great project it can end up in this national um, showcase medium. It could, could be like a subscription series. It could be a, a number. It could take on a number of different forms. Um, plus, I think a lot of orchestras would appreciate having this, um, the infrastructure for all the storage, all the media storage that's going to going to take place because an orchestra concert can take up a lot of gigabytes. Mm. Um, Interesting. Somebody's asked me in the chat which venue in Victoria. It's Christchurch Cathedral. Sorry, if you go to Christchurch Cathedral, Victoria, you can actually see a walkthrough video of the whole of the whole setup. 
So those are just some of the things that my colleagues said going forward that they wanted to see. Right. Um, I, just before we move on to the panel discussion, I'm going to throw it open to the four of you. And is there is there any question one of you would like to raise to the others that that we haven't talked about so far? Let, Okay, I'm going to be provocative in Robin's direction. Sorry, Robin. Um, I admire enormously the work you did with the, the solo singers in Brigham. I have to note that the Toronto Symphony Orchestra members don't have, seem to be involved in the same process. You are correct. And I guess a little context would go a long way here. Um, we decided that we would do this project in August and the TSO recorded their tracks in September. So there was very little opportunity on the front end for, um, for the artist to really be involved in the conversation around what the final product would be. And that is absolutely a, a shortcoming in, in the overall um, success of the project because it would have been really wonderful for us to have that opportunity for them. There's no doubt about it. Um, I think that there, as we continue to work collaboratively with musicians, especially because of course we're work used to working with solo singers and sometimes small ensembles. And so I think in order to bring um, orchestra players into this work that we want to do, putting them at the center of the narrative, then we need to do a better job of engaging them from the beginning. And thank you for calling me out, Andrew, because you're absolutely right. They, this is something that we're thinking about um, going forward and, and will be easier when in working on some more chamber size pieces. Um, but then the question is, how do we translate that into a larger orchestra setting? And that's something we're talking about all the time. Hmm. Yeah. Daniel, let me go to you and. Sure, I just have a, a question and a, and a comment. The opposite of pride is shame. And I think about musicians, how often we live in the shadow of the masters, uh, so to speak, and there's this perfectionism that lingers. So in the chat, there's a couple of questions that talk about that. I don't have much to say. I think it's something we should talk about because we often ask these, sorry, my goodness. We often ask uh, players to play in high, ten high tension situations and now digital and recordings. And then as Bob mentioned, you know, interviews and being a star, how do we equip, do we need to equip musicians for that? Do we just assume um, we can, like how, how, how are we helping with that? How, what have people done that has been um, helped in terms of helping musicians deal with the changing context of what they're being asked to do? Yeah, let's have some comments from the group and then, and then we're gonna throw it open to, uh, to the folks who are uh, joining us. R Robin. This may be a, a little provocative, but one of the things I noticed in Michael Morial's beautiful presentation was this idea of artistic excellence. I have a bit of a beef with the term artistic excellence because my question is whose definition of artistic excellence are we trying to adhere to? And what does that actually mean in a realm where we're working with artists who have varying backgrounds and lived experience? And so what does artistic excellence mean to them versus what does it mean to the, the orchestra or the, the opera company? And where, where is the happy medium? And should we just do away with this term artistic excellence in the sense that it is a very Eurocentric um, idea that is, is focused in you know, specific music theory. And I'm a singer, my singer will show that I don't have all the, all the <laughs> correct terminology, but, um, but yeah, I think that, that it's just something I think about a lot that if, if we're so, so hyper focused on this idea of achieving artistic excellence, what are we leaving on the table in terms of creativity and innovation and artistry? So that's, mm. that's my feeling. Great. I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more with that, Robin. Um, I, yeah, I dislike that term. I prefer, I prefer measuring, uh, the success of something by how well it communicates rather than how note perfect it is. I mean, there, there are so many examples and, and uh, as somebody who has a lot of uh, tastes across a lot of different genres of music, like I don't listen to 
jazz or hip hop or or even you know uh, even other types of what we call classical music which is a terrible term as as well uh in the same way uh, each time so yeah it's very very much so i was really glad to to hear from most of my colleagues that it was it was more the anxiety of the covid protocols that bothered them than the actual than the actual microphones but that is an issue when you are recording there is a huge amount of pressure to get it right and uh, i think about that there's a video that goes around my colleagues a lot of a horn player cacking a note in beethoven 7 and carl booms conducting he makes a face this is a live performance and i'm like you know what a you know expletive I won't, I won't make the interpreter translate my expletives, but yeah, do with less of that and more with, you know, what we're actually really communicating. Mm. It's interesting you say that, Bob, because in my experience, as I said, the worst critics are the orchestra themselves. I absolutely admire that in so many ways. It's about uh, a, a, a wish to do the very best to show themselves and the collective, but I think, yeah, far too often, um, for totally the right reasons and the right motivation, players will say, do you know, I don't think that's good enough to put out. I don't think we should be showing ourselves in that way. I don't think that shows as well. And I'm and I'm in place in the position of saying, do you know, I think it's great. It's great. It's a really lively, exciting performance. It's going to go over well. And the musicians saying, nah. So I think it's an interesting, an interesting dynamic, which is certainly not about management saying. Um, you, you, it's got to be good. It's actually often the players driving that, and I admire them for that. And I, I don't want it to appear a criticism, but it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, it's again, oh. it's the diversity of the group. Like you'll get some people in the group that will never be satisfied with what they put out, and then others that will listen to the same performance and say, "I don't know what you're talking about. You sound fantastic." You know, we uh, we've someone's commented in the chat, and, and I'm going to interpret, but it's really saying. Um, you know, pride and perfection seem to be sort of linked together. And it, that may not be either a, the right link or a healthy link. So uh, is, is there a way of, of recognizing that uh, while still striving for the highest possible standards, you, perfection is, is not, if you don't, if you're not perfect, then you haven't sinned. And <laughs> Daniel. So once you start talking about perfectionism, we're getting into Brene Brown territory, and two of her things are normalization and empathy. So I'll go first and say that yeah. one of the projects that I'm probably the most proud of um, is the, well, one, actually there's two. Um, one is the, the Kitchen of Waterloo um, Christmas Yuletide, and, and, yeah. and the other one is the, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra um, Halloween movie concert. And we did a found footage horror movie slash concert. Is it movies that who knows playing with form, blah, 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 fine. I could like go through and show like where I made mistakes conducting things that I didn't like. Orchestra was great. Um, and also in terms of the script and like the shooting stuff of that, there were there were mistakes in that for sure. And it's actually the thing that I'm the proudest of, even with the mistakes, even with imperfection, even with like the things I look on the screen, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But it is a thing I'm the like one of the things I'm the proudest of, right? So um, I'm happy that I have like a, a small space where I can be like, oh, that it's imperfect, but I'm super proud of it, right? So I think it is it is possible, but it's hard because I want everything to be perfect. Especially as a conductor, I want everything to be perfect. I want everyone to think that I am perfect. And the, I mean, you know, but um, I think I think it's changing. Discussions like this are starting to change things as we decolonize the way that we think about making art. It's really actually it's not, you know, it's oh, this is actually really great. This is really actually helping me as a person and a musician thinking about it in this different way. So I think there's hope. But we need, you know, more for musicians. Hmm. If I uh, may just chip in, yeah, digital doesn't make that easier. Digital makes it harder because of what you just said, Daniel, about you can play it ten times and watch it again. That's when people's sensitivities are great, and I respect that. Right. Hmm. So, so it's in a world where stress is is increasing and has been increased by this pandemic. Uh, people, people's mental health has been jarred as a population. Then I, I think question is, 
what can arts organizations, but orchestras, because we're here to talk about orchestras specifically do to improve that. And we're talking about digital because digital has its own particular stresses. So any, any, any quick comments on real practical things that need to happen? Okay, I'll, I'll keep on going. I think is, is the thing that needs to happen for that question to be answered. I, I wonder, is it, um, is it a systemic thing or personal? If it's a systemic approach to, you know, put up a poster that says, hey, great job, everybody. Or do we all need to be like, um, like Elgar's friend Jaeger, the one who comes alongside the artist who's struggling and says, hey, you did a great job. There's lots of great music that wasn't perfect, but blah, 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 blah. And, incur and like, and I, I don't want to get too pastoral, but are already into it. Like, I think we can be a more encouraging industry of each other in small things, small things count. And I think the aggregate of those small actions between personal interaction, musicians on stage, between musicians and conductors, there have been musicians that have left me in tears with like a small comment when I was feeling uh, not super confident about something, right? And I can like take you back to the place where I was standing when they said a specific thing, right? That mm -hmm. had a great effect on those concerts. So I think on a personal level, we can up the bar in terms of our encouragement of each other, of the normalization of imperfection mm -hmm. and the acknowledgement of yes moments of perfection great on a personal level we can do that and my question because i mostly work on that level i don't know on an administrative level what we would need to do to change the ethos um but i think it's something we need to talk about because um if we're asking players to do these sorts of things and i'm one who asks players to do crazy things all the time i also have to say if i'm asking you for something can i also equip you to do the thing that i'm asking you to do oh. with players it is just often come in, sit down, play, leave, and we don't tell them what's going on. So how are we equipping players to do these? Daniel, how are you equipping players to do these things you're asking them to do? I think that's a question we have to take very seriously mm. on, a, on a you know higher level. Encouragement is easy. Right. I, I'm gonna move us on from uh, to, to another really quite different uh, uh, aspect of digital. And the question that came from, uh, from uh, someone who's who's joined us is how do you convince funders artistic planners and executives to experiment and take risk to do artist or to do artist-centered projects leaping outside of the traditional uh, orchestra structure when you're approaching digital robin andrew go ahead it's jeopardy you have to hit the have to hit the button <laughs> I was going to say, go ahead, Robin, but uh, if you want me to, I think like uh, there was there was a marvelous um, webinar I was in a few weeks ago when somebody was talking about changing the working structure in their organization and they said, oh, we didn't tell our board we were going to do it because we knew that they'd have issues with it. So we just did it first and then they got used to it afterwards. So I think the courage has to come from the leadership of the organization engaged with the whole of that organization to make change. It doesn't come from diktats from anybody and it doesn't come because you can get a major funding body to wake up and say yes this is what we want to inv invest in. I think one of the things that we've all realized when we're in a process of dr dramatic change is we can't look to funders, donors and so forth to come up with a solution for us. It's unreasonable and frankly is a waste of time. So we have to work ourselves in our own areas and frankly also look at each other's work. I mean, even this session, I'm learning things, thinking, ah, oh, perhaps we could have done that differently. Perhaps next time we do this, we do it in a different way. One of the great things about the last 15 months is, boy, have I learned a lot. And we've all learned a huge amount. And it's about using that knowledge and processing it and getting us to a situation where we can, I mean, frankly, I can think of a hundred things I would like to do as projects with the organization that I have the privilege to lead. I'm not going to do possibly five of them if I'm really lucky because of the various constraints, but it's about keeping that positive energy going, going forward in terms of doing things differently and better because you can't do it all at once. If, if you could do it all at once, we just all go away and do it. And the reason we can't go and do it, we don't do it all immediately is because there are constraints. So move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Robin, you were gonna, you were gonna say something. I was just going to say that I think, let's not forget that with greatest risk comes greatest reward, and I think 
funding bodies are asking us to do a lot in terms of unlearning institutionalized oppression and becoming more, um, um, you know, global or global citizens in the way of what are our hiring practices and who are the artists we're engaging. And I, I don't believe that if you have a compelling project that's artist centered that the that arts organ or sorry arts funding bodies would not be interested in funding that because I think it's so well aligned with what their priorities are like the Canada Council strategic plan, for example, speaks volumes to the kinds of things that they're looking for in projects over the next four, um, four years. And so I think if you've got an idea, whether or not it's artist centric is, is kind of irrelevant because putting artists at the center of the work does increase your artistic impact. And I think that funding bodies will, will buy into that. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, let me pick another one from, uh, from uh, our, uh, our friends who've joined us. Um, why, why do companies not leave digital videos up indefinitely online? Robin, why don't you start? Because you, you've had the experience of, uh, of putting Messiah Complex up, taking it down, putting it up. Uh, usually it's because of the union allowances. <laughs> Um, so with Messiah Complex, we worked under an ACTRA contract, which is film and television jurisdiction. We had uh, six months of unlimited use, so however we chose to use it. And when we started it, we really didn't think it would be the success that it was. And so we didn't necessarily have intention of putting it up again. Um, so I guess the big piece of this is that if the piece was had been available for longer than six months, there would have been residual fees to pay to all the artists involved. And that's fine. And we will, we are exploring what that looks like, but it hadn't been, I guess it needs to go back to a, a budgeting perspective. And have you built it into your budget that you're going to pay residual fees every time that your, um, your allowed period turns over. And so it, I think that is just a, an issue that depends on the organization and what the resources are. But in our case, we we didn't have it built into our budget to pay out residual fees when we planned this project and had our budget approved. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. There, an, a really important consideration of this uh, uh, of this issue too is that um, uh, because of copyright considerations, uh, our digital offerings might not be as representative as they could be because um, it, because you know living composers have to live right and uh, um, that's unfortunate because we we want to be as representative of the whole spectrum of music as as possible the diversity of it as possible and um, we don't want to just retread Mozart and Beethoven symphonies as wonderful as they are. So that was something one of my colleagues brought up is that uh, um, this that's that's an issue. And I my hat goes off to anybody like Robin who's doing uh, cross disciplinary work, because with cross disciplines, you have multiple in intellectual property issues um, and multiple union considerations as well. So uh just just saying you know as a representative of musicians that all of these things as far as as far as they go can be negotiated and we do have an agreement we do have a draft agreement of an integrated media agreement for canada that actually gives gives the employer an incredible amount of flexibility as to what they can do with the product um so there's lots of people that'll help walk you through it as well too so you know where to find me <laughs> can i just add two things first is that there is i think a a real positive argument around scarcity and having scarcity of product driving mon particularly monetization um so i think d let's not disregard that I mean, there is a community good which is very important but scarcity is also an intelligent tool in the in the toolbox my second thing I'd like to, I just wanna do a shout out to the CSM for the last 15 months. Um, I could not imagine a more helpful corporation than I've experienced in the last 15 months 
it would have been so easy to retreat behind barriers and restrictions and absolutely the opposite has happened in my experience and Bob, you and your colleagues and the people at CSM have been phenomenal, worked crazy hours, all in the service of our common good, so thank you. Let, let me let me go to our let me go to our uh, our, uh, our our friends online and and ask this: um, what what do the, what do you think the future looks like regarding running digital projects concurrently and in parallel with a regular season of programming? And uh, let me let me start with you, Daniel, to see what your thoughts are. Um. My initial thought is that I'm not sure because I don't think that what, as Andrew has said, that I don't know how sustainable what we're doing is for running at 100% digital. It's, it's not going to be sustainable. But I, what I do think is that we will hopefully see smaller little projects. Some of the, the some of the, the value, the valuable things that digital can give us alongside of live concerts. I think those will remain and those will stay getting to see people up close in different ways. It doesn't digital doesn't have to be a 60 minute concert. It can be so much more than that. And I think as the realities of coming back from the pandemic begin to press in on us and the expectation that we continue with digital, I think we as an industry will find innovative and imaginative ways what, uh, along the lines of what we can offer with each orchestra um, to provide digital offerings that are meaningful and um, yeah, and solid, solid and meaningful. But I think I think it will look different. I think it will look smaller. Um, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Robin, what what about it against the grain? You know, you're you you've got massage complexes in the way in a way in the rearview mirror. What what are you driving towards at the moment? Well, I think we're a little bit different than some of our colleagues in opera companies in particular, because we're looking at the next uh, you know, year and a half will be entirely digital pro programming. And we just announced our second film yesterday. Um, and we've got a full slate of films that we're planning to work on over our next season, which will start in September. Um, I think that we will, you know, like, like has been said here today, I think we will get back to a, a place where there is live performance and um, and digital performance. But one thing that's been really interesting for us to observe is the data around who our audience actually is now. And so our local audience here in Toronto tends to be folks who are 65 plus. And so there's gotta be some consideration around how willing will those folks be to come back into the theater even post COVID? Will they feel comfortable coming back to a live experience? And then so that's our local audience, but then our the 65% of our audience right now does not live in the GTA. And so for us to ignore this, you know, very considerable amount of people who are willing to engage with our work feels, it just feels like a, it, an incredible loss to disenfranchise them from our, our company. And so I think we will definitely go back to live performance. There's no doubt about it, but I think we will also continue to retain some of these fully realized filmed works in mm -hmm. conjunction and our season will look like a hybrid and not just um filming the live works as they're happening i think they'll be made for digital work and then made for live work mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you I i'm terrified by hybrid absolutely terrified um because i think the org the organization i work for and many organizations around the country are exhausted by what they've been through in the last 15 months, achieving some wonderful things. Mm. I think that if you said to me, oh, and next season or the season after, we're gonna do live concerts and they're also going to be live streamed or recorded for video, I'm gonna go and hide under my desk. I think it's terrifying. And it's terrifying for the whole organization. It's terrifying for players who will have to do, achieve everything in one go. So. I, I would, the, the concept of delivering everything to everybody is so exciting, but the, act, the reality of having to do it is terrifying. I think the one thing which we may find works is an either or. I mean, Daniel, you've spoken to doing digital well, doing digital for its own sake, doing digital that's meaningful as a digital product and not just a, a, a a second a second hand way of, of, of receiving a, a conventional concert 
that I think would mean that we're looking at either or, so that we that we don't try to make a digital version of a normal concert and expect that to work. But similarly, we don't try and do the concert version of the digital experience. In other words, we, keep, we treat them separately and, we, and they become part of the total of what we do in a year. Because it doesn't work financially, and by goodness, it doesn't work in human terms. That's what I meant. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Um, we're going to have to stop. Uh, this has been a great discussion, and I think we could keep going. And I, and I, there are some questions that have come in that we just haven't had a chance to get to. And I'm, I'm sorry for those that asked them, but uh, we'll share those questions with our panelists uh, afterwards. Um, but uh, I, I want to thank you. Uh, very, very interesting. And I think we've talked, we've talked about a number of the critical things that uh, that are bundled into the concept of pride of work and uh you know i want to thank you for your thoughtful and uh and insightful contribution so thanks to to all four of you and with that i'm going to hand it back to catherine and uh just so people know i discovered that zoom moved me from the microphone that I thought I was using to the microphone that doesn't exist in my camera. So perhaps I'm actually more uh, more audible now. Like Daniel, I don't know Zoom at all. I've, I've, I've not used it at all in the last year. So it's, it's just kind of a mystery to me as to how it is that these things happen. Um, so Michael, I will simply join you in, in thanking our speakers today. I think you set a new standard in terms of uh, your willingness to say uh, challenging, important, and inspiring things, uh, whether from the pastoral leadership perspective, uh, from the perspective of the death-wielding trombone, uh, or <laughs> which, whichever way it goes. So I'm, I'm really grateful to you for that. Um, I also do once again want to pay tribute to the Canada Council uh, for the Arts and the Digital Strategy Fund for enabling both the research and these conversations and their presentation. Uh, the steering committee for this particular project, and everyone who signed up. We were delighted at the response uh, from the community and uh, really thrilled that you were part of this. Um, I note that there have been uh, some more information uh, posted. We'll be posting the uh, recordings of these sessions and the PowerPoint slides where, where relevant on our website very shortly. Uh, and I just can't say enough about how exciting it's been to be part of this project and to know that the conversation is really only just started. These are Polaroid snapshots of a, of, of a time and a space, and they are uh, things that I think uh, we'll be continuing uh, to return to uh, in the weeks and the months to come as we figure out, continue to figure out what it all means. Uh, and, and where this work is headed. I also want to pay tribute to our colleagues at the arts firm uh, who have been amazing to work with throughout this, uh, this process and as well to our simultaneous interpretation team and also to my colleagues at Orchestras Canada who have really uh, carried this for us. So uh, with uh, all that said, I can simply encourage you to provide feedback to us in the form of the post-event survey. We will be taking this very seriously and again, considering how we carry this work and this inquiry forward. Thanks everyone. Have a wonderful day, uh, a wonderful weekend, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thanks.